we have been really uh, working hard on flattening the curve. That was really what we did for a long time. And with Omicron, we simply don't need any more to flatten the curve as much as we used to. And that's uh, the reason we can have these more open societies. Hello and welcome to Unheard. I'm Freddie Sayers. So a couple of days ago, on the 26th of January, England dropped most of its COVID regulations. Face masks are no longer me legally mandated anywhere. Vaccine passports are not legally mandated anywhere. Some people still use them, but they're not legally required. And stay at home advice, i.e. the idea that you need to work from home, not go into the office, has also been dropped by the government. Well, we thought we were the most liberated country in Europe, but Denmark has just overtaken us. As of February the 1st, they will have no COVID regulations whatsoever. Well, here to discuss this with us and explain why Denmark felt confident enough to make that decision is Camilla holten moller who is an infectious disease epidemiologist working at the state uh, public health agency in Denmark. Uh, she's also the head of the expert group on mathematical modeling over there in Denmark, which is the group that produces the predictions that helps the government make their decisions as to what they should do next about COVID. Camilla, welcome. Thank you. What is actually happening on February the 1st? Is it true that there will be no COVID regulations whatsoever over in Denmark? Well, to a large degree, yes, uh, that is so. So what they also decided in, uh, in the government uh, is that COVID should no, no longer be considered uh, critical to public health. Um, and that also means that the, the, the legislation is, is also changing. So many of these, many of these um, interventions can no longer be supported by legal um, uh, yeah, legislation. So many things will, will simply be ruled out. Uh, for instance, the Corona Pass uh, will go away, and also um, these uh, um, restrictions on uh, and closing down of nightlife and, and cultural institutions is also ending by the 1st of February. If you get COVID and you take a test, what do you do on the 2nd of February in Denmark? Well, we still recommend people to stay in isolation for a minimum of three days, but then we also look at whether you have um, symptoms. If you don't have any symptoms, you can actually uh, go go back out of isolation after three days. If you continue to have uh, symptoms, you should uh, stay in isolation until you're symptom free. And so I noticed the verb there was recommend. So it's no longer a legal requirement. It's just a suggestion. It's a suggestion, yeah. And what's interesting is that Denmark is doing this big step of dropping all of the regulations at the exact moment that case numbers are higher than they've ever been. In the last few days, you've had the highest case numbers that Denmark has ever recorded of COVID-19 in the history of this pandemic. Tell us about that. Why do high case numbers not make the government panic about dropping the restrictions? Well, of course, it's uh, caused by the Omicron variant that we also saw taking over in Denmark. It started uh, early December and then it actually totally replaced Delta within a month. Um, and what we also saw is now that we actually have a sub-variant of, of the Omicron called BA2 which also seems to be a little bit more infectious, but still have the same, um, it's, it's simply less uh, severe also compared to the first Omicron variant. Um, and that is why we see these really high uh, case numbers each day, but we don't really see it in, in the severity or uh, in, in hospitals. So patient going to a hospital, of course, there are a lot of people with COVID, but they're not necessarily ill from their uh, COVID. So, so um so it's, it's basically because we have this Omicron variant that we now are confident that we can actually uh, start opening up again. So is it fair to say that you're no longer worried about case numbers, especially? You no longer think that's a useful metric? Well, more or less. Of course, the case number still indicates also that you could have a, a, a wave also in, in hospitalizations. Um, so what we are uh, especially concerned about is, of course, our risk, uh, risk groups, uh, old people and, and uh, people with comorbidities that they could still uh, have a smaller wave with Omicron as well. But we really do see very few people in intensive care unit and, and those people going to hospital are there for a shorter stay. So for now, it isn't really worrying uh, that to that extent. And what you mentioned earlier, are you saying that some of those hospitalizations or numbers that count as people with COVID in hospital were just in hospital for something else and now they have yeah. happen to have COVID? So you're not worried about them for that reason? Well, it still, of course, you need to uh, take precautions and in hospitals when you have all these people showing up at hospital and still need treatment, but also have a positive test. 
So it's not like you can rule them out. You still need to take care of these patients in a certain manner. But, but it's not uh, in the same way that we saw with the Delta wave, where we actually saw people got really ill, even vaccinated uh, patients could uh, have severe illness. We don't see that to the same degree with the Omicron. And that's uh, really, uh, that's also the reason we have based these decisions upon. So this is a huge moment, isn't it? Uh, not only for Denmark, but in the way that we understand this pandemic that has dominated all of our lives for two years. Historically, for months and months and months, it's been when cases rise, we know that there's going to be a delayed but coming effect on hospitalizations and ultimately deaths. And that's why all of the modeling people such as yourself have had this huge power because they've been predicting what that relationship will be. Are we to now conclude then that this is basically the end of this pandemic? Well, we have been really uh, working hard on flattening the curve. That was really what we did for a long time. And with Omicron, we simply don't need anymore to flatten the curve as much as we used to. And that's uh, the reason we can have these more open societies. I definitely believe that SARS-CoV-2 will continue circulating uh, during the the summer uh, period as well. And we also expect that in winter, we will start to see uh, case counts going up again, simply because we have the waning immunity of the vaccine. So the population immunity will start decreasing. We are also considering, of course, that we could uh, end up seeing new variants um, that will have a play. But for now, I think with the Omicron, we're in a good place. And we definitely think that after we have peaked, which we also consider that we will be peaking in a short time, we expect the, the springtime and summertime will be uh, pretty quiet, I think. I mean, you talk about the potential for new variants. Something that's been said a lot is that the normal progress of a virus like this is to become more transmissible but milder because ultimately that's good for the virus in some way. That seems to be what's happened with COVID-19. Does not that not mean though that it's, it's less likely that suddenly the next variant will be much more severe? I don't think we can say that. I think it's too soon really. And, and of course, I've, and what we observed with the Delta variant was that it was actually both more transmissible and more severe. Um, and it's really a, a kind of a lottery with these mutations. So I don't think we can say with any certainty that it will be a less severe variant the next time. At least I'm not confident in that. Um, so, but of course, what we do see now is that the immunity, the population immunity is really high right now, both in vaccines and hybrid um, vaccine and, and uh, recovered infections. So, so we're in a different place, I think, with the Omicron that actually boosted our immunity, population immunity. And that's a good thing. Uh, for my chair. Because this is a, another really important question that you've just um, come upon, which is this whole idea of natural immunity. Previously, that was very controversial because it, it was considered dangerous to either allow people to be exposed or deliberately encourage people to, to be exposed because they could get very sick. If Omicron is as mild as it appears to be, is there some argument for actually saying it's, it's a good time to be exposed to COVID-19? Well, you can also always uh, argue whether that's a good idea or not. You never can foresee who is actually uh, ending up with severe illness. So it's a bit of a chance, I, I would say, to do that. Um, I wouldn't ex- uh, advise people to get exposed and deliberate. Um, I still think that it's um, part of the reason that we're actually opening our society now and, and uh, annulling all of these restrictions is that we can see that it, it, it probably will still have good uh, protection from the vaccines and that we can see that people get less uh, severe illness uh, in case they get infected. So we're not that worried anymore of people getting infected. But I wouldn't say it's part of our strategy to have people infected. But it's okay to observe that immunity from infection is powerful, at least as powerful, can we say, as immunity from vaccination? What's your professional view on that? That's, that's uh, um, well, that's, uh, you need to discuss that with an uh, expert uh, in looking into uh, immunity. I think you could say that you have some uh, protection from the Omicron, but how does it protect against uh, former variants and new variants? That is the question. Uh, just as we know that the vaccines don't actually cover all variants equally well, uh, we will probably see the same, that different uh, variants that we had uh, during the past will also protect against new variants in different uh, ter- terms. So one person that had the Delta variant might be more um, protected against a, an upcoming new variant than if you have had Omicron. We don't know that simply. If you compare some of the continental European countries with a country like the United Kingdom, um, the UK opened up earlier back in July and there was a lot more, there was a higher level of infection 
And some people observed that we were less badly hit in the winter than some of those European countries and suggest that might be partly why. Do you think that's a reasonable way to think? Well, I, I think it definitely is uh, something you need to consider. The Simply the state of the population or the population immunity, as, as we call it, um, how well is it uh, built up and what does it mean for next waves? Um, I did do, uh, well, in Denmark, we saw that the immunity is uh, primarily by vaccination. We actually have had very low prevalences in Denmark. We didn't have that large waves. And probably that is also why the Omicron have an advantage right now is simply because it's an immune evasive variant. Um, so, so in other countries where you used to have high waves or high peaks uh, of other variants, you might do better or see less Omicron simply because it doesn't have an advantage uh, as it does in high vaccinated uh, countries like Denmark. Um, so, so definitely there are something about the population immunity and to what uh, extent is population immunity from vaccines and, and recovered, uh, recovering waves. What's going on in terms of Denmark versus Sweden? Because this is something we've paid quite a lot of attention to. I'm partly Swedish. At, earlier on in the pandemic, Denmark was very stringent. Uh, they were one of the first countries to close their borders. Even they closed their border with Sweden controversially, while Sweden had a much more liberal attitude. And now it seems to have swapped around to some extent that Sweden is now discovering lockdown style measures, although not a full lockdown, but limits on parties and curfews and those kinds of things, whilst Denmark is opening up. Have they swapped? And what's going on there, do you think? Well, not on deliberate, I think, but uh, what we do see in Denmark is we try to do precision epidemiology, so to say. So we try to to really have uh, good information. We have been testing quite a lot during the epidemic um, and doing a lot of sequencing and variant detection and uh, a lot more than Sweden have done. And it's always difficult to, to, to compare countries. But I think in the current situation, we might just be a little bit ahead of Sweden simply because... We, we, we're looking at it in a different manner, so to say. We, we have these detailed information on the BA2 variant, which is difficult if you don't have a, a large test, a testing system or variant detection. Do you think we're able to say which country of those two had a better policy looking back on the last year and a half? I think that's really difficult to judge. Um, and, and historically, we'll, we'll have to sit down and, and take a look into what, how did we um, handle this differently and uh, what was actually uh, working well and what worked less well or where did we overdo something. So there will be definitely a need to evaluate uh, the strategies uh, that we chose and, and how it uh, actually went on from that and, and looking at mortality, etc. Very diplomatic answer, if I may say so. So... Let's talk about politics for one minute, because your, your country, as far as I understand, all of the political parties support this opening up. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. Which is an unrecognisable world from here in the UK, or I think the United States, or many, many countries where it's become such a political argument. And if one, the government says one thing, the opposition says the opposite thing. How did it come about that everybody agrees now, even though these cases are going through the roof, that it's time to call an end to restrictions. What's different about Denmark? Well, I think there's, uh, for first of all, a high trust to health authorities and also for the Epidemic Commission, who is actually um, advising the government and, and advising our polit- politicians here in Denmark. as a high trust. I think that, that uh, it's it's the correct um, um, so to say, uh, they trust that these are the correct solutions. And, and this was actually by the Epidemic Commission that, that um, um, proposed uh, that these restrictions were uh, lifted. And, and the, the whole um, government and, and uh, all of the politicians actually agreed to that. Um, so, so, yeah, in general, I think it's related to high trust in, in health authorities. Let's talk about your specific work here, because a big part of the evidence for the government being able to release those restrictions was your reporting. You're in charge of the mathematical modelling group. And just before Christmas, you produced a report that looked at what the effect of the Omicron wave might be over in Denmark. And I think it's worth actually spending a little time on the specific conclusions you reached, because they're quite different to what the modelling group's Uh, concluded here in the UK. So I think we've got a chart that we can put up on the screen of your predictions versus what actually happened. So first, there's Mm -hmm. there's the question of cases, how many cases there would be. So talk us through what we're looking at here. 
Yeah, so just before Christmas, we did this uh, model uh, where we tried to, to look at Omicron and Delta and uh, how would the uh, case counts develop uh, until March if we uh, projected uh, the epidemic, so to say. Here, uh, the black dots are the case counts and, and the gray bars are the um, uh, collected, uh, are the, the total case counts here, uh, projected total case counts. And then you see in orange, the Delta uh, actually being totally replaced. Uh, the red dot is simply because we didn't have a full uh, case count from that day, but what you see here is that we're actually hitting the roof of our projections here, um, and 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 quite uh, within, uh, uh, so to say, the span of the projected uh, case counts. So the predictions uh, turned out to be pretty well, but we also see that that uh, something was growing a bit more than we actually anticipated, and that's because we had the BA2 taking over in week two. Um, so underneath, you also see uh, sort of two strains growing at the same time. Let's look at the next one, which is similar, but this which shows um, hospitalization. So these are new um, people being put into hospital with COVID each day. Yes. So, so these new to hospital is, is uh, similarly also uh, we projected uh, that, that we would have a peak here in the beginning of February simply because you have a uh, kind of a delay from the case count peaking until you see the peak in hospitalizations. So what we see here is also that we are well in within uh, the projected um, span. Uh, actually, now we do expect that the peak might be postponed a little bit because of the BA2 having a little bit more growth um, than the BA1. So it might be actually that we we expecting to peak a little bit later and maybe a little bit higher, but but we're well in, within the span. I mean, we are not used to seeing this kind of thing over here in the UK. This looks like a pretty accurate model. The, the dots are mainly within the cone. <laughs> this is what should happen, right, with a mathematical model. Both of the things you've shown us are where the actual data falls roughly in the range that you expected it to. So I'm guessing you're feeling quite pleased with your modeling. Well, yes, definitely. I think we have uh, fulfilled our task, which is to inform our decision makers of what to expect, what to come. So the million dollar question is, how could it be that prior to Christmas and in the early part of January, you remain confident that there wouldn't be a huge dangerous surge in hospitalizations and deaths that required very draconian lockdowns, whilst other modeling groups such as some of the groups here in the UK that were advising our government, came to a different conclusion. What's your understanding of that difference? I, I should say that it is really a difficult task, but also early in December, we also had some models where we actually projected all higher peaks in hospitalizations, which was mainly owed to the, the uh, many uncertainties of the Omicron. At, at first, we simply didn't know how severe that model, uh, or sorry, that variant could be. But as soon as we had new data, we have put that into our models and informed the models. And that's why we came up with this model that you just saw, uh, showed on the screen. So uh, knowledge is key and, and really to follow this really closely. And that is yeah, coming back to the detailed data we have in Denmark. That's really what we owe it to. So I'm going to put another chart on the screen, if I may, which is um, one of the most famous modeling groups here in the UK, which, well, there were two. There was one from Warwick University, one from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. They both came up with similar kind of conclusions, but I think this is the Warwick chart we have, and uh, you'll be able to see the difference between what was projected and what has actually happened. So <laughs> it's a kind of a different story. Um, this, this was, and I should say, this is actually with a severity of 50% of delta. They also produced one with 100% of delta, which was even more extreme. Uh, and what's happened in reality is just so far beneath what they were expecting. Do you have any insight into the technicality of that? Because I looked in detail at your report here, which is um, your model, and it seemed to me that you were also factoring 50% of severity of Delta as the sort of mid-case scenario, which was the same as those UK groups. So how could it be that your results were so different? It actually depends on what type of model you uh, have here. And I don't know the details of the Warwick model, but the, the type of model, uh, whether it's a population model or an agent-based model, but also the, the detail of the information that you put in it. We also have um, big issues uh, related to the vaccine effectiveness uh, for the Omicron and also transmissibility when you are infected, even 
that those are other parameters that are uh, equally important to have a correct uh, model estimate. And what we did in our model was simply to sample within a span, saying that uh, this is what we're looking at that could be most feasible for the Omicron variant. So, so some of these, uh, looking at these projections, um, what we know today is that it's, it's probably even less than 50%, maybe it's 20% um, um, less severe, uh, that, that we see it, that it's even less severe, the Omicron variant, but it could be some of the other parameters that you use in the model that are simply um, not correct or didn't uh, hit spot on. Do you think it's fair to, to be worried that there is a kind of bias towards negativity in making these models? That, for example, if we take this question of severity, in those days before Christmas, there was a lot of discussion of how confident we could be that Omicron was less severe than Delta. And to most common sense observers, the real world data we got from South Africa made that pretty clear because had it been as severe as Delta, they would be having overflowing hospitals and they weren't. And yet there were these incredibly sophisticated reasons given why we couldn't be certain that it could still technically just be to do with differences in age profile or prior immunity or whatever from South Africa. So that data set was kind of ignored. And Professor Neil Ferguson produced a report at Imperial on the 17th of December, I think, the same day that your model came out, saying that there is no evidence, no firm evidence that Omicron is less severe than Delta. And so that was the presumption that went into advising the government. And I suppose similar things with those other variables you talk about with vaccine effectiveness and those kinds of things. Do you feel like it's possible that in Denmark, when you're doing these models, you're looking at a kind of central scenario and just trying to estimate whilst in some other countries, perhaps including England, we are training our modelers to be erring on the side of caution? Well, of course, that's a difficult question to answer. I would say that that we also did these uh, the same approach, simply modeling different um, scenarios, also the severe scenario and the less severe scenario. So that would be a typical model approach that you need to uh, actually uh, showcase your uncertainties uh, or uh, uncertainties, because that's uh, truly, really important to, to the decision makers that it could be A, but it could also be B. And then, of course, you need to narrow in. As soon as you have the information, you, you would need to, to reproduce your models and see now that we are more certain, we can see that it's actually going this direction. Um, so, so in the beginning, when we did our models, we also had a lot of uncertainty on the estimates, um, and we have been trying to narrow it down as fast as we could with the information we thought we had. So, so you, so so you haven't it's... been looking at other countries' models and, and analyzing why they were so different? You don't have a theory as to what variable no. it was they chose wrong? No, not exactly. I can't pinpoint that, and it needs really a lot of work to 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 get into other models. It's it's not just a fast, a quick look. You can do that. You really need to spend some time and understand the parameters you have chosen to put in your models uh, to say why they are so different. Um, what what you also see sometimes is that uh, you use a panel of models to inform um, your decision makers because it, it it can be quite different from the choice of model that you have and the details in the model you have. One more question on this, because I've done some um, back of the envelope calculations here. Actually, if your numbers, you, you, Denmark is a population of 5.8 million, you were forecasting 25,000 to 55,000 roughly cases as a peak, and 150 to 360 hospitalizations per day as a peak. And as we've just seen, roughly, that is what happened. England is almost exactly 10 times the size of Denmark, 56 million as opposed to 5.8 million. And had our modelers been like you and forecast 250 to 550 cases a day and 1,500 to 3,000 um, hospitalizations a day, they would also have been roughly correct. We had slightly under that. Our peak, it looks like, was 205,000 cases and hospitalizations 2,300. So your model times 10 was a pretty good forecast of what happened in England. What we got from SAGE, the government uh, committee was actually 600,000 to 2 million cases a day as the maximum and 3,000 to 10,000 hospitalizations today, a day, which is five times plus what actually happened. I know that you can't be responsible for anyone else's modeling, but I just want to ask one more time. Can you understand how groups in other universities came up with such wildly different 
numbers. It, and it leads people to feel conspiratorial, feel distrusting of the whole process of mathematical modeling, that different groups of experts can come up with such divergent things. What should we think about that difference to try and understand it? I know that uncertainty and, and these uh, insecurity intervals that you have in these models, they're really a difficult thing to communicate. We also had some issues to even communicate the span in our models because that's also equally a wide span. And it is actually quite difficult to communicate because when you do um, handle an epidemic, you want to be quite certain and you, you can't always have these certainties in models. So basically it comes back to what can you use a model for? Um, I think, and, and, and how do you interpret these uncertainties um, in, into how to handle the, the epidemic? Um, so, so there can be a number of reasons why this, they actually projected this and why the span was so large. I think we saw it in other models trying to, to uh, estimate or project the Omicron wave. Uh, we also saw it in, in uh, some Norwegian models that also had a quite a large span. And as I just said before, we also saw that in the Danish models if, uh, in the beginning where we had a lot of uncertainties, but it is really a continuous work to inform your models and try to understand what is going on exactly in your country. For instance, in our models, we have put in some assumptions about uh, people also um, changing their behavior uh, underneath. So when, when cases go up, you actually see a population behavior change. And, and that has been one of the, the key uh, figures in our model um, that we actually can see that people change behavior uh, whenever um, cases go up. Uh, so that's uh, actually putting a lid on the top of our model, so to say. That's very interesting because it, that's explicitly something that the models that fed into the British government were not asked to consider. So I, I've read within the Warwick model, for example, they say it is beyond the scope of this model to estimate endogenous or natural behavior changes that aren't mandated. I mean, that's a pretty significant difference. It could explain most of the difference even, couldn't it? Well, uh, at least we saw it was really important in Denmark. And, and we have been working quite a lot with our models for the last uh, two years and, and seeing that it was a, uh, an, and really an important thing to, to put in the model, these uh, behavior changes. Um, the other thing is about a susceptible, susceptible depletion, um, simply having <laughs> no people anymore being susceptible of being infected. So you can have these small uh, groups for instance, age groups or specific uh, geographical areas where you start to see uh, that there's simply no longer any people um, uh, susceptible to the infection, and then it starts to burn out more or less. And that is also related to how you build up your model if you actually can detect these susceptible depletions. So there can be some small details in each model that actually defines whether you have these peak shaving, as we call it. Because that, what you've just mentioned, is another thing that has been so talked about and so important in the last two years, which is when a, a new wave is just getting going and everyone is talking about the doubling rate, oh, it's going to double every two days or double every one day or three days. And everyone then just extrapolates that for as long as they need until it gets into the millions and everyone gets very frightened. And then what seems to happen in the real world is that that pace of exponential growth doesn't last and we get to a slowing down for other reasons ex that are not to do with government intervention. Is that is that fair? Do you observe that, that, that there's a sort of, is that what you mean by this susceptible yes, depletion? Yes, more or less what I mean. Yeah, well, the susceptible depletion is, is uh, for instance, if you had a really high peak in, in school children, at some point uh, you wouldn't have any more uh, pupils that you could have infected simply because the reproduction number in that specific group would be below one. Um, so, so there wouldn't be enough people to infect to actually keep it going in that group. And that means that you would take out some of the the growth of the epidemic, that's what we call susceptible depletion. And you can have that in the whole population. You can also have it in, in areas or small pockets of your population. And the other thing is the behavioral changes. And, and that, that's a sort of a different manner. That is more so whenever you see, on, for instance, in Denmark, we had the municipalities uh, sending links out on Facebook or in your uh, social media feeds that, uh, so now, um, case counts are really high in your area. It could be in your parish or in your municipality. And uh, we would need to do something if, if uh, case counts don't go down. So people would try to, to actually um, go and have a test or they would actually annul a party, cancel a party or do something differently um, than what they ha had actually planned that we actually saw that people tried to, to um, so to change their behavior simply to, to have the, the case count going down in the area. 
In other words, it doesn't need to be a law. People actually no. have common sense and they have a brain and they can observe what's happening and adjust their behavior anyway. Well, they do to some extent. And of course, that also has a limitation. I mean, to some extent, you don't really regulate yourself that much. Um, you still need to go to work. You still need to send your children to school. So it also has a limitation, of course. But we did see that it is a factor that actually plays a role. And that is also to a high degree what you saw in Sweden. So even though you didn't have the government mandating uh, lockdowns, you actually saw that people would actually change the behavior accordingly. So when you do try to measure the, the restriction level, it was kind of similar actually in Sweden because people simply um, self-regulated their behavior. Are you worried about the role that your discipline and expertise has had in this pandemic? Um, it's become very controversial at least here in the UK, lots of people are happy to bash the modelers because they always seem to be getting everything wrong. And there's this presumption that they are fear mongers or they're trying to always look to the worst case scenario. How does your discipline emerge from this period, do you think? Is, the, is its reputation damaged? I know that it has been quite an, uh, so to say, an, an, an issue that, that you really need to communicate these uh, spans and uncertainties. But I still think that Mathematical modeling has a, a place in this, uh, how we inform our, our decision makers to, to know what's lying ahead. When you're building that model, when you're instructing your team and you're sitting there and there's big pressure because the health of the nation depends on it, do you feel pressure to err on the side of caution ever? I mean, when you're choosing what presumptions to make or what inputs to purge or ranges, do you feel the the sense that it might be safer to presume the worst or, well, or have really you never felt that then you <laughs> no we don't do it like that i mean it's really a large team and what we we try to to use all our best knowledge in epidemiology or the best knowledge of vaccine effectiveness all you know the the estimates that we need to put in the model we always strive to, to be updated and to have the newest uh, figures and newest information to, to inform our models. So it is really a, a huge job to update these models and make sure um, that we understand what is going on in the model and, and um, that we can actually have the, the correct uh, parameters in it. And, and that is a, quite a big task to, to keep up to speed all the time. And it, especially when you change variants all the time and you don't have that information, you need to choose really carefully and, so and you, exactly, so you block uh, out you block out any sense of whether it might be politically more welcome to veer one way or the other and you just try to yeah. make the best estimate yeah so in denmark we are a small country so we don't have that many model groups as you do in the uk but it is actually a combination of, of experts from different universities that are sitting together and, and doing these models and it's completely an external expert group. Um, we only have a few modelers that is actually situated in uh, State and Serum Institute. So just, they are kind of um, not, de they're detached from the political situation. So they um, sit and simply do these models the same as you do in UK, basically, but, but they're not really affected by the political level. Um, so we, we always strive to, to use the information we have in hand. Camilla, what do we need to do to persuade you to come over here to the UK? Because there may be some <laughs> vacancies in the modelling community coming up, I believe. <laughs> well, I think the model community is really uh, need to get together and look into each other's uh, successes and, and uh, failures. We also have failures. Uh, I guess we can share uh, the knowledge and, and um, stronger, build a stronger model um, community ahead. Dr. Camilla Holtemola, thank you so much for talking to us. Welcome. <laughs> That was Dr. Camilla Holten Moller from the Danish Public Health Institute. She is in charge of the mathematical modeling for COVID over in Denmark. And it is on her advice that the Danish government has decided to do a bonfire of the COVID restrictions and reopen society from the 1st of February. Interesting there to meet one of these modelers. There's a lot of talk about how flawed or complex mathematical models related to COVID have been. She seems like a very uh, common sense and intelligent person. And sometimes I was wishing that maybe she would come over here to the UK and replace some of the sage modelers that have made our lives so complicated for the past year and a half. Thank you to her and thanks for tuning in. This was Unheard.